Okay. Uh, so a couple of administrative notes. Uh, the proposal was made, as you already know, but uh, I thought I'd share the Instagram. Uh, so that's what the proposal is. The new project is roughly divided into, like, I think it's a total of 25% of the grade, so it's like five days. Same time, uh, we'll follow the original ordering as we sent out. Uh, and so we'll be there from 3 to 5, maybe 5.50 if we need to finish every key. Uh, but uh, the room is written more 4.57 uh, That's why we're uh, Please be careful. Uh, do not plan to go, do not go over. To the work. You don't have to create a lot of slides. Uh, what you just have to do is make sense in the small. Open up, tell us exactly what problem you're solving from uh, an application perspective, and then pretty quickly from a machine learning perspective. It's a classification problem, here's my input, here's my output, and we just have to see what I've done so far. It will be much, everybody will be well grounded if you very quickly get to the things that we need to know so far. Okay. Alright, um, any questions about the presentation? So, one of the questions is Yeah, that's up to the team to decide. You can split how many you'd like. Uh, I can ask anyone of them. So, so each presentation is the main point of the 25 of the project. So, it's roughly split into this is what you proposed, this is where that halfway point, and then same. So, how much have you Will you create the presentations to scores on the presentations? It's not based on it's not based on finesse of your speaking, it's based on how much you've done. So I will be asking you how much you've accomplished and based on how much progress you've made. Yes, I will be doing it. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so last time we looked at uh, neural networks and towards the end we were looking at convolutional neural networks. Um, and I guess I, I later realized, uh, how many people have never taken a signal processing class? So CS people tend to do this. Uh, and I guess I glossed over the fact that 2D convolutions wouldn't make any sense uh, if there is a signal processing kind of problem. And then it, I should have I should have been clear. You know, it's, it's not a new. That's not a prerequisite of the class. Uh, but so I thought I'll take some time to ex explain visually a lot of these things. Um, and it's important because these things come up in a lot of these models. So I'll uh, walk you through. All right. So. Let's look at like the extremely vanilla version of uh, convolutions, right? So, a TV signal in this case, an image. Um, it's an extremely small image. It's uh, it's upscaled here. This is a pixel. Everything here is a number. It's an intensity from zero to two fifty five, um, right? So we can every time we uh, hover over a pixel, there's just a number on you. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, convolution of so this is a 2D signal, here's another 2D signal, which is what we were calling filters. Right? So this is a particular filter, which is, I'm, it's going to be clear in a second why this is a blur filter, for example. The people who have taken signal processing and image processing sort of see these things coming. But it, it's a 3 by 3 filter, right? it's just a small matrix. Um, and here's sort of how you would compute convolution. So on the left is an input, on the right is an output. Right? So here's what you do. Place the filter at any particular location. Place the filter at any particular location. Here are the numbers, which are the intensities underneath this patch right here. That's the that's the image. You know, 206, 205, 247. That's just that's just the intensities of the signal. Um, here are the multiplicative factors that the that came from that filter. So this was our filter. 0 0.065, 0 0.125, and I'll tell you a reason for those numbers in a second. But you multiply 
you multiply this number with each value underneath, and then you sum the total up, and you get an output 178, and that goes into the center location of this, right? So this is the output, and that gets placed here. That makes sense? And what you do is you just sort of scan this through. So you place it here, place it here, you get a different number, place it here, and you sort of just scan it in rows and columns, and the output of that scanning is the image that you see on the right. Now, the people who actually have taken signal processing know that I'm fudging details a bit. That's not actually what a convolution is. What is a convolution? What did I just describe? For the people who said that they have taken, what did I just describe and how is that different from a convolution? Yeah, I actually defined, described something called a correlation, which is, this is a cross correlation because I actually didn't flip the filter, but for people who are seeing this for the first time, don't worry about that detail. Right? It's just a 2D flipping on this. But here's, here's where things get interesting, right? I can sort of, here's a, here's a filter that I'm constructing here, and here's the output of the convolution or the correlation process that we're doing. So the filter is all zero, right? You obviously get a zero output, right? If the filter has is identity, right? Every patch that you place it on doesn't really matter what the neighbors are, right? This thing just, whenever it places on the input, it actually just extracts the output, and so you get the image back. Right? So convolution is sort of a linear. Uh, dimension of the image is uh, somewhat reduced. Right? Dimension of the image is actually expanded um, because when you it depends how you handle boundary artifacts. Right? So if you if this this particular animation won't let me go beyond the leftmost column, right? um, but if the so if there was a height and the length of the filter, which you actually width and the length of the filter, you actually get width plus length minus one. Right? So it actually increases the width. Okay, so you, if you place it beyond the image, I imagine that the zero is Exactly. Like you can zero pad it, you can boundary. So this this is sort of boundary artifacts. You can flip the signal and that sort of uh, But usually people don't worry about that, uh, about the boundary effects. Um, but so here's the identity filter. Um, and here's a particular filter that is often used in image processing. So you write plus one here, minus one here, and zero here. And the interesting thing is the output becomes this. Anybody want to tell me what that is? Anybody who's taking computer vision or image processing? It's an edge detector. Uh, it's, it's a vertical edge detector. Um, because what it does is it looks at this pixel, so it, you know you place this everywhere, right? It looks at the right pixel, subtracts the left pixel, and whatever's the value place it with. So anytime there's a strong gradient happening here, right, in the in the image space, but the values here are significantly larger than values here, that's when this is going to fire and you'll get these sort of things, right? So it's a vertical uh, edge detector. And you can construct sort of uh, you can put a plus one here, you can put a minus one here, zero here. And that becomes a horizontal edge detector. So the wrong horizontal edge detector. And you can obviously make this oriented by adding, by, by making the filter larger and putting things on the diagonal and so on. Mm -hmm. So this is sort of what we were talking about when we were explaining sort of a convolution or a convolutional neural network. Now the key thing here is, uh, in all of this, I hand define certain filters, right? And then a lot of computer vision this is sort of the first elementary process. You hand define a couple of filters, oriented gradient operations, but in convolutional neural networks, we talked about the fact that you know, we don't want to hand define these filters. We want the network to learn what the filters are that are useful for these tasks. Um, and so we talked about you know, parameter sharing, and so a convolution layer, for example, is basically a neural network layer where there is a filter, um, and this filter are parameters that are learned, right? So uh, assume you know what this filter is, you're going to go ahead and perform a convolution. The input is, you know, here's, the, here's the activations of the next uh, layer. Um, and what you'd like is uh, to learn multiple such filters such that if, you know, if, a, if a horizontal edge detector or vertical edge detector is useful, the network should learn it itself. Right? And so what we, that's what we were doing when we were visualizing these things, right? Uh, so I guess these are those, uh, so those are the filters learned by layer one, and they end up being basically oriented gradient filters, right? So they end up computing edges 
Um, and that's what these patches are indicating. The patches from the image are that uh, produce maximal response with respect to this particular image. So that should make sense. And I guess now that you understand what the convolution operation looks like, it doesn't have to be this. It can be sort of any arbitrary sort of intensity here, and it's looking for that pattern. Whenever it finds that pattern, it's going to fire this number. The images in the layer one and layer two, they are actually the outcome after applying the filters? Or? Neither. Uh, so this one is the actual weight. So it's the it's the filter that it is, that's being learned. This one is not the output. This one is actually the input that produces the maximal output response. So it's the input that matches with the filter the most. That if I were to ask you, this is a hidden unit. What does this? What is this hidden unit trying to detect? It's trying to detect these kinds of things. Right? These are the things that produce the maximal activity. So instead of uh, representing filters by number, we are representing filters by images. Not really. So filters by number are exactly this. Right? So we are representing filters by number. I'm just this figure is just an illustration to see what has the network learned. In practice, in practice, your network looks something like this. Your input is an image. You have one convolution, uh, which produces one map. And then you have multiple convolutions, which produces multiple maps. And then which is usually followed by some sort of a subsampling procedure. So the image or your maps, or activation maps reduce. You know, convolution plus nonlinearity subsampling, more convolutions, nonlinearity subsampling, till the whole thing becomes a small, low enough dimension that it becomes a multi dimensional and so these things are actually numbers. They're just like the three by three tables I showed. Um, this is what they this is what they look like if I just do I am show of those three by three numbers. And this is the input patches that it most likes. And so the lower ones tend to be mostly oriented gradients. The higher ones, so this is layer two. It's you know tends to be more interesting structure like circles. Um, and even higher layers tend to be uh, sort of more interesting patterns or parts or all kinds of things. And sort of layer five, you end up getting like dog face detectors, if you will. So here's here's the filter that is this that look itself looks like a dog face, and here are the images that produce the most activations, and they look like they're also dog face detectors. Right? But none of that is good. Okay. Any more questions about that? Yes. So. Um, are those uh, dog face detectors overfitting right now? They look exactly like one of the right? So the way to think about this is your task was not dog face detection. Right? Your, ta your task was, given an image, tell me what's present in the image. So the architecture was actually this, or slightly like this, I'm fudging details a bit. The architecture was input an image and output in this case, 10, 10 dimensional outputs, digits. Um, those filters that I showed you were not trying to do digit recognition, but image classification. So there's a, there's a list of 1,000 categories. Dog is one of them. Actually, it's, it's subcategories of dogs for, for that experiment. But it tells you what is present in the image. So nobody ever hand coded that if you want to find a dog, try to find faces of dogs, because they tend to be pretty distinctive. It's just that one of the neurons, along the way in this architecture, ended up learning filters that helps it find dog faces, which then help predict the later layers that, oh, there might be a dog here because I see it. Yes? So um, the whole structure of the neural network, um, how does it work? So for example, for the, for the weights, for example, um, does it assign more weights to the images that would uh, produce the, the most activation? Does it, like for example, for this example, if you if you had like a dog face, for example, and you're trying to see uh, what's present in the image, like from the, from the neural network uh, structure that we that we saw, how does it exactly happen? So the so the way the training is happening is the input is an image, and you know what the ground truth is. So it's a if you have 1,000 categories, then you, it's a 1,000 dimensional vector with zeros and ones, whether or not a category is present or not. Right? Convolve, nonlinearity, subsample, convolve, nonlinearity, subsample, multilayer perceptron, you produce an output for this image. Right? Your output is going to be some distribution over these 1,000 things. And you're going to be wrong somewhere and correct somewhere. Wherever you're wrong, that's going to be a loss. 
right? You're going to compute the gradient of that loss with respect to every single parameter in every single layer, right? And you're going to take a step in the direction of this. Computing this gradient is going to be back prop, right? And so when you take that step, you will improve that, you will minimize that loss. If you run it long enough, you'll see the loss functions converge to zero, and these weights will then be able to predict the, the ground. Yes? So do you manually choose what kind of image filters do you use? No. Uh, so they're completely learned, right? Just, none of this is, none of these filters are manually. So forget these convolution parts, right? What if it was just multi-layer perceptron, right? What if it was just an input multiplied by a matrix, right? Those weights that produce activations. You don't manually choose them. You just initialize them, and then you take a step in the direction of the gradient. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. The application of convolution nets are <clears throat> just for images? Uh, usually any 2D signals. So that's an excellent question. When would you use it? Uh, not just images, people all of, not just natural images, people have used them for RGBD, so depth cameras like Kinect. People have used them for multi-spectral imagery, so infrared uh, channels as well. But you have to realize that there's a key assumption being made here, and that assumption is this, right? That the assumption is that somehow my input has a two-dimensional structure. Therefore, I should not connect the hidden neuron to everything. That there is some locality. Right? That's why you connect it only to a patch. That's assumption number one. And assumption number two is stationarity. Right? That a patch here is no different than a patch here. Therefore, all of these weights can be shared in a convolution. Anytime you have that sort of structure in your input, you can use this assumption. Usually ends up happening with two-dimensional data or multi-spectral two-dimensional data. Deep learning is generally, I mean. Yeah, so the idea of neural networks and deep neural networks is applicable to any sort of data. Um, convolutional neural networks, for example, can also be applied to one dimensional data, right? If it's speech signals, so it'll just be one dimensional convolutions. It'll just, these are easier to visualize. And right? you can see what the filters look like and what the outputs do. But the idea of fully connected layers and everything, completely applicable to any types of signals, any types of features. Uh, Gaussian random numbers. So you just sample numbers from a Gaussian. So, so every net neuron will, will be one convolution. Every neuron, uh, not quite. It's not the case that every. So you can think of it as every filter is one parameter that you're learning, and the output of a filter is an entire map, right? Everything in it is a neuron, but we don't think of it that way. So in convolutional layers, the figure to keep in mind is this, right? That there's an input, and it produces multiple channels of hidden responses. Each, each channel is an image itself, a 2D signal itself. So you can start calling this pixel a neuron as well. But really, all of these neurons in the same channel are sharing the same weight, because they're the outputs of the convolutions, right? So all of it, they just Every pixel here is connected to some pixels here. So for example, this pixel is connected to this thing, and it's multiplied by that weight vector. And everything that lies in the same channel is sharing those same weights. So, any other questions? Yes? Um, so in the um, second layer, uh, there must be six filters. That's why there are, sorry, the one before. Yeah. There must be six filters. Yeah. And next is subsampling. Yeah. So from there, um, I mean, I didn't understand how it's 16. <coughs> it should be 16 to as many number of filters, right? So each map will be convolved with all the filters. Right. So what you actually do is, and I'm fudging, I fudge this detail a little bit, but. Uh, so this layer has six filters. This had only one input. And so each filter convolved gives you six of these maps. Once you have six subsampled maps, forget the subsampling part, right? That's not the important part. In order to go to the next one, you actually have filters that convolve this, convolve that, all six of them, add them together, and that's an output here. Right? So it's like convolutions of, of a bunch of these, addition, and that's when you get this. And another another filter comes in, convolves, adds, and that's the output here. This is just like a multi-layer perceptron. If this was a scalar, there's a weight uh, vector, there's a there's a number that you multiply the scalar with, this one, this one, this one, and you add them together, and that gives you the response here. 
except now this is not a scalar, this is a, this is a matrix, and the scalar product is essentially a computation. <coughs> So I'm sort of being loose there, but in your in your mind you should think of how do we go from six to sixteen? It's because this one had sixteen filters. It's just each filter had access to all six of these. Same process for RG and Same process for RG. That's why there's one channel here. Actually, there's RG and B, right? So each of these six actually are running on RG. So I didn't actually show, I actually just showed subsampling. Right? How do you do that subsample? You can do max pooling, or you can do average pooling, or you can just do literally subsampling, where you just throw away the data. That is handling. Usually people do max pooling, it tends to work better, it gives you robustness. Uh, but that's that's a design choice. That's not something that you're optimizing for. It's high capacity. <coughs> so yes. for different teams using deep learning, for the image classification, what is the difference <laughs> that causes different accuracy and uh, <laughs> 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 So typically if you if you go to some of these conferences and you look at the, the differences, usually what's happening is that um, the first architecture that came out had five convolutional layers and three fully connected layers after that. Um, and that, that was a paper that came out in 2012, um, Alex Krzyzewski, Jeff Hinton, and B.S. Tukaskar, and that made significant improvements over non-convolutional neural networks. So after that, what's been happening is, A, the networks have been getting deeper. So instead of eight, people have gone to 12 and even 20, there are different networks. But you can't just do it naively, so some of, some of the layers are also changing. So this layer, for example, has only whatever, you have to decide three by three convolutions, right? Uh, Google actually had the entry that won in the ImageNet competition this year, 2015, no, last year, 2014, and their entry consisted of each layer did not have a single size convolution, so if there was a 5x5 convolution and a 3x3 convolution and a 1x1 convolution, they were just adding and upscaling it. So each layer itself was a pretty packed uh, task, not just a convolution. And so it's designing the network architecture to be, to have more the more layers you add, the more parameters you, you have, and therefore you need to be able to learn all those parameters, it's much easier to overfit. Um, and so you have to design them so you're exploiting domain expertise and something. <coughs> Any other questions? So now the experts, instead of designing features, they're designing how many parameters you should have, where they yeah. should be. Yeah, yeah which is, I mean, so there will be a day where <laughs> There is no human in the loop <laughs> anywhere, right? Where it's just data that we know nothing about. Is this a physics experiment? I don't care. Is this an image or a signal? I don't care. And there's a, there's a, there's a joke that uh, I think I've mentioned to you guys. Being a computer vision person these days is pretty easy, right? It's just uh, you're a machine learning person who has access to two-dimensional data. <laughs> used to be difficult when you had to understand images and geometry and all those things. Being a speech person is easy, it's just machine learning applied to one dimensional data. But if you actually stare at the models, they're not, mathematically, the one way of thinking about it is this is a complicated function. This is f of x, f of f of x, f of f of x, and this is an extremely complicated function. But it's not an arbitrary complicated function, right? It's not that you can just take your data, project it into an infinite dimensional space, and somehow expect to learn reasonably. It's the fact that the assumptions made here, convolutions make sense. It, is a, it makes sense for this data. If you had data where convolutions did not make sense, if you really just took 10 sensor measurements from a chair and then made <coughs> data into a table, you know, a two by two table, and then fed that into a convolution, it won't work. It just won't give you reasonable results because convolutions don't make sense on that sort of a data. So there is human expertise here. I think there will always be human expertise, <laughs> but I think it's better to have human expertise in architectures than features. Uh, it, there, was a, there was a talk where initially when deep learning was, was starting to work in computer vision, Jan Lukum was giving a talk and somebody in the audience said, I don't understand why this works. Why does this beat everything that we were doing? And I think his one line answer that stuck with me was, because gradient descent is better than you. <laughs> because this thing can learn, you can optimally make progress on the on the loss function, you may not be optimal. And I don't mean you in <laughs> <laughs> this, this is what we as people were doing. We were looking at what causes most improvement, but gradient descent works better.
Okay. Any other questions? All right. What's the difficulty in deep learning? What's the hope? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people are saying a lot of effort on the training process, like tuning parameters or... Do you have an answer to that? Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, many open problems, right? Uh, the objective function is still not convex. Uh, we know gradient descent is not guaranteed to work. So it's actually somewhat surprising that it does work. There's some new understanding that it's, you know, it's not the case that the shape of the function looks like one local minima is so much better than others. It, I, there is some in recent theoretical work to suggest that multiple local minimas are effectively the same. They're not significantly worse than each other, so it doesn't matter where you get stuck. Mm -hmm. You'll still do fine. Um, the key sort of, if you were to think of it as a practitioner, should I get into deep learning? A, you should have access to a large amount of data set, right? So a large amount of data. If you don't have a lot of data about your domain, these things will extremely quickly overfit and you will not be able to do that. One of the reasons that we saw significant successes was that a new data set came out called ImageNet, which had 1.2 million images, each one annotated with 1,000 different categories. And it was finally able to learn some of these, all the parameters that we needed to learn. And the argument that people have made is that you know, these models just needed a lot of data. They were, they were overfitting all this while, and we didn't have the data, and we didn't have the computational resources. That's where, so data is, where, data is one, and GPUs are the other. Can we actually make this fast enough that we can actually get this done? So if you want to get into this, have access to a cluster with a thousand <laughs> GPUs, uh, and have access to a data set with millions of images. Oh uh, yeah, that was one of my questions. Like, what is that large data set that you said millions to thousand images? So usually, in all of these cases, large isn't a number. Large is respect to some model choice that you're using, right? You can always increase the size of your model and make that large enough. Okay. All right, so hopefully that um, gives you some more intuition about computational neural networks. And if you're interested more in deep learning next semester, there's an entire 6,000 class in deep learning. That's what it is. Um, so, but coming back, so the flow of this class, we're talking about we did linear classifiers. Then we went to kernel classifiers with SVOs. Then we went to non-linear classifiers with neural networks. And today we'll see a different non-linear classifier, which is decision trees. Right? Uh, and in some sense, you know what decision trees are. Uh, <laughs> so you dropped food on the floor. Did you eat it? Uh, <laughs> yes. 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 Was it uh, all solid? Yes. Was it expensive? No. Is it bacon? Yes, eat it. <laughs> <laughs> we know what a decision tree is in some sense. But today, what we we'll look at is mathematically what are decision trees, how do you learn them from data, uh, and why are they still around? Why are they still used? Okay. Um, these are also uh, nonlinear classifiers that are in the sense that they will end up learning decision boundaries that are nonlinear in your feature spaces, also in the weights. Uh, the synonyms, so you, you'll hear these terms decision trees, you'll hear card or classification and regression trees because decision trees, uh, decision trees can also be used for regression. You'll hear these terms called ID3 and C4.5, which is extremely odd acronyms to hear, but they're sort of learning algorithms for uh, algorithms for learning decision trees, both parameters and structure. Um, and that's actually one thing that will separate this from a bunch of, for example, neural networks. Uh, the algorithm will learn the structure of the tree and the parameters of the tree as well. And if you hear a term random forest, it's essentially multiple decision trees. Right. And formally, it's uh, bagging applied to decision trees. Bagging is something that we look at in the next class. That's all. Okay. Uh, ID3 incidentally stands for Iterative Dichotomizer of Version 3. Right? It's <laughs> something that came out in the 70s. Um, and C4.5 is really, it doesn't stand for anything. C is the language it was coded in, 4.5 is the version. And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> for some reason, it became popular enough that it's actually called C4. Uh, all right, let's look at what a decision tree looks like.
this is not a linearly separable data set. There is no line that will give you 100% like, performance and then we'll separate. Um, here's what. Uh, here's, so here's the uh, classification of the decision boundary known as the decision tree. It says all of this region is you know, plus one, all of this region is minus one. It actually does a little bit more. If you ask you to generate a report, it will give you something that's you know, human interpretable. And that's actually one thing that uh, separates decision trees from other classifiers like neural networks and NSPMs. It actually tells you something that you can read. You can say, yeah. Here's what this classifier does. If x is less than negative 0.05, which is the threshold, just predict minus one and ignore this number for now. Um, if x is greater than, so by the way, this is what that was, right? x is less than negative 0.05, so all of this it predicts as minus one. That's the minus one class. Um, if x is greater than minus 0.05, then you check y. If y is greater than uh, y is less than, y is less than. So if y is less than 0.6, okay. x, y is less than, <coughs> x minus 1. It's the opposite. Am I missing something? No, it's correct. Minus 1 is minus correct. Minus 1 is correct. Because oh, it's no. bottom no. of. Minus 1 is the blue class, I thought, oh. which is why x makes sense. The axis must be yeah, the axis is really important. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so the larger point still holds that uh, you can actually not just get a decision boundary, but you can get something that is human interpretable. You can look at, you know, these are two-dimensional features, right? You can look at what are the features being branched. And a decision tree consists of uh, a tree structured uh, classifier that has, a, has, a, has two types of vertices, an inner node and a leaf. An inner node is where it branches on, initially we talk about only one feature at a time. Um, and once it reaches a leaf, it makes a prediction. Right. Um, this is actually one of the reasons why people in um, medical domains, biomedical imaging, and those sort of areas really, really like uh, decision trees. Because after the thing has been learned, you can convert this into a set of rules. And that makes it a lot more transparent when you're talking to a domain expert. You can tell them, here's what my classifier has learned, if you will. Which is not something that you can easily do with an SVM. Feature number 27 multiplied by a weight vector doesn't really mean anything to a domain expert. It feels very black boxy. <coughs> Here's somewhere else that decision trees are actually used. Uh, so the Kinect stuff, uh, we all know that Kinect has a depth uh, sensor, so it gives RGBD, but actually if you open the Kinect API, uh, they actually also solve this problem. Yeah, they solve this problem. Um, they can go from a depth image to predicting uh, key point locations. So they predict for every pixel in the frame whether this is your left shoulder, right shoulder, left arm, right arm, left elbow, right elbow. So they get you know 3D uh, sort of key point locations and segmentations of uh, of the human body. Um, and the algorithm underneath this is really a large ensemble of decision. Where at each leaf node you're sort of trying to predict. And this is learned from a really, really large collection of data. So all of these images are uh, ground truth images. This is all, all you see are blurry pixels. Each one of those is ground truth. Um, so a few things about decision trees before we get into it uh, deep enough. Uh, decision trees are one of are one of the few, not one of the few, I'd say, but from what we've seen in this class, they, 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 of all the classifiers that we've seen in this class, they're a little different in the sense that the hypothesis space, which is the space of all possible decision trees, is isn't exactly predefined. You sort of you change the hypothesis class based on how much data you have. 
a linear classifier is always a linear classifier. Right? A weight vector, no matter what you learn in the set, is still going to be a linear classifier. But the decision boundary that is learned by a decision tree depends, amount, uh, depends on how much training data you have. Because the deeper you go into the decision tree, it's actually carving out a deeper boundary. Um, they can, there are the number of parameters in a decision tree, there's actually discrete, it's a mix of discrete and continuous parameters. Because you have to choose which feature do I look at at each internal node, and uh, what do I predict at the leaf node. So those are continuous parameters, and which feature is the discrete. Um, decision tree boundaries uh, in terms of feature spaces often look like uh, sort of axis parallel uh, rectangles, if you will. So you, the, that's the example that we were seeing on the, on the app. It often looks like you know, greater than this, greater than this, predict one, greater than this, less than this, predict one, greater than this, less than this, or something, right? So there's a sort of tree stuff. Um, and you can sort of usually learn any Boolean function in a decision. Let's see. So let's let's start uh, let's start with a concrete example. This is going to be a running example throughout the literature, throughout the the class. Um, this is the data set that you actually already played with. This is the miles per gallon data set. Right? I think we gave it to you for a regression problem. Um, you have various each one of the rows corresponds to a particular car. Um, you have various things like miles per gallon, cylinders, displacement, horsepower, weight, acceleration, model year, maker, blah blah. Right, that's what your data consists of. Let's say we have converted miles per gallon. You were solving a regression problem. Let's say we have converted into a classification problem. Make our life simple. It's only good or bad that we're trying to classify. Uh, initially, what we'll do is we'll focus on decision trees with discrete features. So all the features there are discrete. They're not continuous. Um, but later on, we'll tell you what to do with continuous features. Right, so here's something that is called a decision stump. You pick one feature. And so in this case, I picked cylinders, number of cylinders in the car. And I basically create, so this is this was my all of my data. By blue and red, I'm indicating the two classes. I had 22 examples of bad miles per gallon and 18 examples of good miles per gallon. And I split it into each of these buckets or sub data sets. One for each setting of these, this feature that I picked. This is called a decision stump because if you think about a uh, continuous case, you pick uh, an axis aligned coordinate and you sort of break your uh, uh, data into two halves. Right? Um, in this case, for example, let's say we, you know, cylinders equals three, there's actually not any examples. Cylinders equal four, we have most examples coming from good, five, one, zero, uh, six, eight, zero, and nine. It's pretty clear that having picked this one feature, and splitting your data set is the same thing probabilistically as conditioning on this feature. Okay. Each, each one of these has this value conditioned on. It's also clear that a number of those sub data sets, the problem has become somewhat easier. We started off with a nearly uniform distribution on y. That's the variable that we'd like to predict. So 22, 18, nearly uniform. In a lot of these sub bins, the distribution is far peakier which makes life a lot easier, because you know what to do here. Right? This is mostly bad, so one thing you can do when you're in this bucket is always predict bad. And the same thing for each of those buckets. Right? So this is a stump, this is one node, and you can generalize this idea into an entire tree. Right? You pick cylinders first and branch on that. Then you pick here, horsepower, and you branch on that. And you pick something else, Pause in a second. You pick something else and you branch on that. Something else and you branch on that. At the very end, the things that don't have any children, those are the leaf nodes. Everything else is an internal node. Leaf nodes actually make predictions. Internal nodes just do branching. In this restricted setup, the internal nodes only get to touch one feature. Right? Does that make sense? So this is formally a decision tree. Um, one thing that we'll talk about is not all features or attributes need to actually ever appear in the tree. Right? So this, this tree does not need to be full. For example, if you have D features, this doesn't have to be 2 to the D number of nodes in this, in this tree. Right? You, don't, you don't have to have depth tree. Um, uh, a feature and attribute may appear in multiple branches. So for example, let's see, does that happen? Horsepower. Horsepower, yes. 
So horsepower appears here. So it's first split on cylinders, then maker, then horsepower. Here it's cylinders, horsepower, and drift. So uh, uh, a feature may actually appear in multiple processes. But here's something that may not happen. On any path, no feature will appear more than once. And this is, we're talking about, this is true for discrete features, not actually for continuous features, but we'll come back to that. On discrete features, it's actually pretty clear why you should never do this. If you've already said conditioned on some feature equal value three, downstream, there's no data that is ever coming this way with that feature equal some value something else. So there's no point to say. Um, and here's the, here's the thing that's going to be a problem in our case, that actually many trees can represent the same concept. Um, and I'll go over this in a second. I'll take a minute break, but we'll look at this particular Boolean function, and, I, and I'll draw two different trees that will represent the same concept, and that's why picking a tree as a learning algorithm will be so beautiful. So I'll, I'll pause for a minute. You have, you have three features, right? A, B, C, and there's a Boolean concept, uh, Y, that you're trying to learn. Here's a deterministic mapping from your features to that concept. Right? There's no noise in your system right now. It's just an illustrated example. You can write down 0, 0, 0, 0 the entire truth table, right? 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, Right? And I can I can look at that this relation and I can say, all right, when both a and when I when both a and b are on or a is off and b and c is on, that's when y is one, right? So I can easily do this. 
So A and B, okay? So that's this guy and this guy. Here, Y is 1. And then I can do not A and C. So here's the not A and C bit. Here's the not A and C. So these are also 1. And everything else is 0. And so this is, the, this is the concept that we try to do. It's just a tricky thing. Um, and here are two different decision trees that can represent that same concept. You can think of this as your data set. You just have eight examples in your data set. And here's, here's a simple tree. So first you split on A, so this is false and true. And if A is false, we split on B. And if A is true, we split on B. So if A is false, we split on C. Is false if here. Uh, C is false if A is false. C is false. C is true. This is y equals one. C is false. This is y equals zero. B is false and true. A is true. B is false. We get y equals zero. All I did was I broke this up into two clauses, there's an O R here, right? Uh, and A is appearing in both clauses. And that's something that we realized. That's why we branched to an A first. And so we were able to create this decision tree, right? A, C, and then you're done. So this has only uh, two levels and then one leaf. Right? What if you branched on a, on a bad feature first? Right? So if it is false and true. B true. Uh, so it feels like if B is true, we should then look at A, right? Because that is what will determine false and true. But if B is false, we know that this can still happen, right? So if B is false, this can still be true. So then you need to launch on, let's say, either A or C, but then you still need to, uh, no, let's say you launch on C. So B is true. A is false, B is true, A is true, then this is y equals 1, B is false, and then either you branch on C, is it clear that you still need to branch on A here, mm -hmm. right? So your tree is going to be much deeper depth, and at the end, you're going to learn the same, basically the same truth here. So, these are two trees that if you follow your way down, you end up learning the same concept. You're given a data set, and these two trees would give you 100% training error, both trees. That makes sense. So the goal here is learn a simple tree, right? Or learn a tree with few vertices or, or less depth. And that's going to be problematic. Many trees can have the same concept, but not all of them will have the same size. And having extremely deep, deep trees means that you're checking a lot of features, which means you're splitting your feature space into extremely fine bits. This feature value has to be set to true, this one has to be false, this one has to be true, the other one has to be false. If you check against everything, and there's no label noise, you will obviously get 100% training accuracy. If, if I give you a truth table, and you check against every single uh, feature value, you can learn any concept you want. There's no label noise. So if you ever have a path in your tree that is of length D, where if you have D binary features, you can obviously have zero training. But what we'd like is to have the, have the shallowest tree, if you will, and that's going to be a difficult problem. So this is another one of those cases where learning is going to be difficult because this is not a continuous space. These are not parameters. We will not appeal to non-convexity or anything. We can directly appeal to sort of a search problem, and we can give results about NP like this. Finding the simplest or the smallest, lowest depth decision tree is an NP problem. That was shown very early. So we're not going to be able to find the best tree. There's not going to be a polynomial time algorithm that will find you the challenge. Does that make sense? So we have to resort to an extremely simple greedy heuristic. Um, and it's going to work really well in practice. 
Uh, and here's, here's the heuristic, and it should already be clear uh, what the heuristic might be. You start with an empty tree. Okay? You pick, you define some measure of best. Right? You, there's some way of, for you to check every feature and pick a good attribute or a good feature to branch on. You branch on that, and then you just recurse. Right? That's it. This is, this is the entire algorithm. Right? You pick one feature at a time, split it, and then everything underneath, just call that same function again. This is all of it. And that's sort of why you should be able to get the name iterative dichotomizer if your features are true or false, right? It just breaks your data set into, mm -hmm. into two. Make sense? Yeah. Here's what this visually looks like. So given the example that we were working with, you know, you have a car data set. This is, every single row here is a data point. These are all data sets. Once you do the splitting, this is the sub data sets that you've created. This is, you know, all records or, or examples in which cylinder is equal to four, cylinder is equal to five, cylinder is equal to six, cylinder is equal to eight. So you've created these sub data sets. And each one of these sub problems has these sub data sets assigned to it. And now you just have to recurse on each one of those and pick another feature to split up. That makes sense? So that's it. This one gets this data, this one gets this data, this one gets the data. And so essentially the, the function you need to implement or write up is a function that gets a data set, has access to some number of features, and has to pick a feature to branch on. Right? That's it. And then you, it just calls itself again. So here's, here's one recursive tree build, here's another recursive tree build, and ultimately you just recursively go in and build the entire tree. So there are sort of two issues that we have to discuss. One is the obvious one, right? How do you pick a good, what's a good feature to branch on? And the second issue is when do we stop? Right? We don't want to go all the way to a full depth tree because I could have done that trivial. Right? That's just a full tree and we can always do that. But that's not what we're interested in. Okay, uh, so choosing a good feature to branch on. Uh, here's a simple, simple data set that illustrates that concept. Uh, you have x1 and x2 and you have y. Um, this is, you know, the features are binary and the class labels are also binary. And if we, so we have only one choice to make. Pick, you know, pick either x1 first or x2 first. That's the only choice you get to make. What do people think? Which one should you branch on? X1. 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 Why? Because x1 value is enough, you can eliminate. Has it? Has it? Has it? Has what? The biggest influence on the decision. Has the biggest influence on the decision. Picky decisions on both sides. Picky decisions on both sides. No, it's consistent. What is true usually the result is true, but X is not consistent. Yeah, so there's some notion of correlation that people are looking at. If I look at if I look at X1, these are the four cases in which X1 is true. Yeah. And usually that it leads pretty closely with Y, and you know there's there seems to be one thing where there's a noise with respect to X1. Now I've obviously sorted this data to illustrate that X2 seems to you know flip around, uh, and so it doesn't really not very predictive of of the label that you want to choose. And so somehow what you want to do is you want to pick a feature that nicely is you know correlates intuitively correlates very well with your class label, or makes it a little easier after you branch on the left and on the right. If there are two choices. It's very clear what to do after you branch. Mathematically, you can see that the variable you can kind of factorize in the function. Mathematically, you can see there's a variable that you cannot factorize. That you can factorize. That you can factorize. Uh, define the factor as. Uh, like, take it outside the product. Uh, like, you have like a sum of products, and you can like factorize that one. Yeah, yeah. Intuitively, we'll, we'll sort of make that intuition. For example, in this case, we have uh, two false x1 with two x2, and we have true y and false y. So in this particular case, um, we would choose if x1 if x1 is false, all of them will be false because generally that's the case. Even though there is only, I mean, even though if you have false true, there is a 50% chance to have each. Let's do that one more time. So let's see this on the board, right? So if I do actually branch on, if I do branch on x1, it can be false, it can be true. The data initially was 50, no, it wasn't 50, 50, right? Five out of eight, so three out of eight initially were false, and 
5 out of 8 can actually go through. Right? This is the distribution of y before the split is made. After you make a split, after x1 is false, you have 3 false, 1 true here, and x1 is true, you get uh, no. 0 false, 4 true here. Right? So this is what we were talking about, that splitting on x1 seems to result in a uh, your data set becomes simpler on both sides. You know what to do here. Majority vote uh, seems to tell you that predict false. This one, majority vote, uh, you should have uh, strong confidence on. That makes sense? This reminds me a lot of the game Akinator I met you, you know, It's like a, the gene that asks questions, trying to uh, guess what person is thinking. Of. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. So the 20 questions game, right? Yeah, exactly. No. These are the same ideas. Can you quickly condition so that the depth of the tree is low? So what is my um, as I answer this? What is my idea to stop the decision tree there and not go to X two? Yeah. So here, for example, so th this is the second question that I talked about, right? When do you stop uh, this recursive process? And we'll talk about this. One place where you should stop is when no further splits can actually ever make the problem easier for you. This problem is about as easy. There's nothing else that you can do to this that can have more than 100 zero split rate. Here, it can actually improve, um, and so you may decide to split on um, x2 and actually go further down, but later on we're gonna talk about the fact that deeper decision trees will overfit. Right? So, the, so the more things you branch on and split on, the smaller data actually makes its way down here. Right? So 50% of your data made, made its way down here, and 50% made its way down here. The more branching you do, at the leaves, you may actually only get one sample, in which case, even when you're making majority vote predictions, they're going to be extremely noisy. Mm -hmm. So if, if we are going to split uh, that depth size by x2, then I think we're going to have problems after right? this. Uh, not really. What problems do we have? So if we do split it on x2, x2 is false, x2 is true, so we're in the x1 false regime. Uh, Oh, I see. I see what. Uh, so if x two is true, you cannot really tell. Right. So you get a one one case here and a zero uh, two zero case here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So this. Yeah. At this point, your data set is such that it has labeled noise, right? So you basically you have false and true labeled as output true here, and false and true labeled as output false here. So this is what is known as label noise, right? So this is Bayes error. You cannot do better than this. Conditioned on for the same conditioning on X, there are just two different Y's that are provided to you in your training data, which you're not going to beat this. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, I know this is this is a small data set, right? But in this case, uh, what what would be better to stop it in X one or to go to X two and maybe to to uh, to uh, run to uh, Number. We, we'll talk about this in a second. Uh, one of the common strategies is you keep going and then you prune your tree back. Right? So you keep going till you get pure leaves. These are pure leaves that where decision is completely trivial. Um, or till you can, or till you have exhausted all your features, you can no longer split it. And once you've done this, you actually go to a validation set and you prune your tree back. Okay. That's. So is that any other questions? Okay, um, so this is this is a really nice example, right? We've sort of we know that splitting on X one is a good thing to do early on. It'll lead to shallower trees, um, but we need some sort of a quantitative measure, some objective function that I, that uh, that tells me I check the value with respect to X one, I check the value with respect to X two, and it tells me that you know splitting on X one is better. Right? And this is where all the e people of you are already in your mind screaming the answer, which is. How do we how do we know this is a good distribution and this is a bad distribution? Entropy. 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 Thank you. So all the signal processing and the communications people already know this. Uh, if you have a conditional distribution, so a y given x one equals true, right? This is a conditional distribution. This is a perfectly peaky distribution, right? So this is a distribution where uh, one of the ends is probably one, and this is as bad as it can get, it's the least, it's the most uncertain distribution. Mm -hmm. So one way of characterizing 
you know, this is what we like and this is what we don't like is the notion of entropy. Uh, we've already looked at this in class before, but you know, the idea of, for discrete distributions, we define something called the surprise function, which was you know, log, uh, the negative log probability. Um, so how surprised should you be when an outcome of a random experiment comes in? Right? It's, you should be as surprised as the inverse of the property, but also the log of the inverse of the property. And then this is just average surprise. Right? Um, and so we talked about this, if you think about it, uh, uh, a coin with two sides, uh, probability P indicating the, the probability of heads. If that probability is zero, then there's no entropy, right? You're always going to see heads, uh, or you're always going to see tails. If that probability is one, there's no entropy, right? So that, that's also zero. In the middle at 0.5, this is the most uncertain that this distribution can be. This is split 50% between heads and tails, and that's what this curve entropy is, is indicating. And the communication people also know this as, you know, the number of expected number of bits required to go to zero. But it doesn't really matter. Okay. Um, the thing that we're going to look at is not entropy, but something that's closely related to entropy. takes a particular state, right? Um, and so I'm going to write down, this is going to be specific, and I think I'm making this notation up, but I think I've seen it somewhere else. So let's see. So specific uh, conditional entropy. So entropy, like how uncertain are we just about y? Right? You conduct a random experiment whose outcomes are different determined by probability of y. You conduct this experiment, how, how uncertain are we about this, right? Um, conditional entropy specific is how uncertain are we about y if I tell you that x takes this particular state, right? So x is some feature or some variable that I measure, and I tell you that it took probability, it took state heads. Now, how much uncertainty do we have? And the thing you should keep in mind is exactly this thing, right? I told you that x1 is true, but now how much uncertainty is in y? And this is just this expression, right? So summed over all y, probability of y equals little y given x equals to x, log probability of y equals little y, x equals to x. And this is negative. So this is specific conditional entropy. And the thing that we're actually going to be interested in is what is commonly called conditional entropy, which is just represented as h of y given x, which is you know, this was if you knew what x was, what if f, what if x was the outcome of a random experiment, right? So you, it, it occurs with some probability, so you just take, you know, it's the expected, so sum over all possible values of x, probability x equals x times h of y. Does that make sense? x is a random variable that occurs with this probability. For each of its state, you know how much the entropy in, uh, you know what the entropy in y is, just take the weighted average. Right. Another way of thinking about that is x can take you here or down this branch. There is some entropy in this distribution, there is some entropy in this distribution. You just take the weighted average depending on whether your data split 50-50, for example, and you sort of just write that. I, I've sort of written weighted averages of distributions, that's not the same thing, right? I'm saying this box indicates compute the entropy and then do the weighted average of the entropy. Does that make sense? Thanks for that So let's let's just do this, right? So what is the what is the entropy of this distribution? Something you want to yell out? Zero. 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 The entropy of this distribution is zero because the probability of true is one, so it's one times log one and the probability of zero times log zero. 
and it usually you define uh, 0 log 0 as 0, right? So this is 0 and log 1 is also 0, and so this, this summation is 0. The entropy of, so h of y given x1 equals 2 is 0. Right? That's the condition, that's the specific conditional entropy of y given x1 equals 2. You compute the same thing on this side, which is going to be 3 over 4, negative 3 over 4, log negative 3 over 4, minus 1 over 4, log 1 over 4, which is going to be some number. Right? Half of that plus half of 0, so it's just half of this. That makes sense? That's the conditional entropy left in y after you have made the choice of x. And the choice in x is a random grade. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's like how much uncertainty is in this distribution, how much uncertainty is in this distribution, average of those, weighted average. So far so good. And a good feature is one that leads to smallness. Exactly. So a good feature is one that leads to these distributions having as small entropies as possible. And so the formally, the thing that we're going to look at Called mutual information. Mutual information, which is I of I of y comma x is entropy of y minus conditional entropy of y given x. Think of this as what was the uncertainty in the distribution about y? And what is the uncertainty after I told you x? Right. So it's exactly this thing. Right? This is what we started off with. This was the distribution over y. And this had, let's say this was 4 by 8 and 4 by 8, right? So this would be the uniform distribution. This starts with the most amount of uncertainty possible. Here, this is the least amount of uncertainty possible. And here, this is also pretty small. So this is the drop in uncertainty. And I take the average of that. So this is that drop. Right, so drop in uncertainty after I tell you what x should be. That's known as mutual information, and our goal is to find an x that has the highest mutual information. Right, so a good feature of x star is equal to r max of i y of x, r max of x. Which is if you stare at this, you realize this is just a constant with respect to x, right? It doesn't depend on feature. This is just what you're starting with. So this is R min of x of i. Sorry. Y unit. Yes, that's right. H. Thank you. Make sense? That is solution, right? So h of y given x is summation over all possible x's. H of y given x is a summation over all the states of x. True, false, one, two, three, four. That makes sense? So it's important for you to know that this quantity is actually symmetric. That you can write the same thing as entropy of x minus entropy of x given y, but we won't use that fact here. Uh, the other thing that you should keep in mind is this quantity is, is called mutual information, but in decision tree liter literature, often it's called information gain which is not technically correct because information gain is really y comma x equals little x. This quantity is information gain. So it's just entropy of y minus specific conditional entropy of x. Um, and really, this quantity is the expected value of x. That quantity is uh, expected value of information gain. But there's a sort of smudging of, of uh, notation. So when you pick up a standard notation or decision trees, when they say information gain, they're actually really talking about mutual information. Okay. Does the mutual information measure the correlation between x1 and y? Like? Not correlation. It measures the degree of dependence between x and y. How much, do you, how much does knowing about x tell you about y? Because if x was equal to y, if x was just a copy or another name, the conditional entropy of y given x would be zero. If I tell you x, 
then this, you, you know everything about y, so it becomes a deterministic distribution, so h of x given y is zero, which means the drop in entropy is the maximum that it can be. Right? So it's a degree of dependence between x and y. And that's what you're using to branch. So the things that are most, in some sense, I, I, I informally use correlation because it's not correlation, right? It's a degree of dependence. Uh, so the things that, that have the most mutual information you want to split on first, it's going to lead to uh, distributions, conditional distributions of y given x that are as peaky as possible. Mm -hmm. Make sense? information or bar, so the benefit of, an, of a feature or attribute is just decrease in uncertainty. So entropy of y before you split, entropy of y after we split, which is this is the specific uh, conditional entropy and this is the expectation of that and therefore this is uh, mutual, which is a conditional entropy and you take the difference between that, so entropy of before splitting, entropy of after splitting, that's the mutual information. Um, and so that's it. That's the algorithm that we're talking about. That this is this is all you have to implement. That somebody gives you a data set, go to every feature, split on that, compute the um, compute the conditional um, entropies, take the difference. Don't even have to worry about this if you just continue to max, and that's your feature to split. Here's visually what it may look like, what it looks like from this data set. So we talked about you know the car data set. Um, you're about to split for the first feature, so you have to evaluate every single feature that's here and every single state of that feature. Right? You have to split on everything. So in each of those rows, it's showing you a distribution, basically. After I split, after I condition on cylinders equal three, the data set actually vanishes because there's no point. After I split on cylinders equal four, it shows you that you know there's roughly 10% of the data is blue and 90% of the data is red. Split on five uh, that has uh, all groups. Right? So if you stare at all of these states are for cylinder, uh, this has low entropy, this has low entropy, this has pretty low entropy, and this has pretty low entropy as well. Right? So on average, these have low conditional uh, entropy for y given cylinder. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it has high mutual information. And so the number is 0.5. If you do that for another variable, so for example, here's, here's a variable that doesn't seem to help. This is nearly 50%, this is bias away from 50%, but you know, this is, the inf mutual information is pretty, pretty small. The drop in entropy is pretty small. Mm -hmm. So you sort everything, compute the highest one, that's the one we're splitting on, and then just repeat. Okay, so that was most of the algorithm. Any of these algorithms, when do we stop? So keep the threshold on. Keep the threshold on. Uh, entropy which you can. Actually. Keep a threshold on information gain. Uh, so you're basically saying when the information gain gain goes below a threshold, stop. So out of all three stopping conditions that I was going to ask you, that's the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> so good luck. Uh, but let's let's build up to it. Here's. Uh, and I'll, I'll stop in a couple of minutes. But here's here's one place where you usually want to stop. Uh, if you ever <laughs> if you ever reach a, a a node where the data set has zero entropy, mm -hmm. right? The data that is reaching there has zero entropy. Entropy after conditioning can only go down. Right? That's the fundamental theorem, right? This is has to do with physics, right? We cannot you can you can only cause disorder, <laughs> you cannot create order. Uh, so this entropy can only go down. It's already zero. Can't go not go lower than that. So there's no point splitting after this, mm -hmm. right? That's one stopping criteria. Nobody, nobody's gonna argue against that. Um, here's another stopping criteria where you have gone through the entire length of the tree. So you split on every single thing. You're at the, at the very end, and there is still some entropy left. You will not typically reduce it. This is label noise. You just have to deal with this, right? This is another stopping criteria. Here's the third one that you guys talked about. If all attributes have zero and all, all uh, features left, Right, all the features that we're trying, if they have zero information, uh, you actually talk about the threshold if the threshold is zero. So there's no single feature that causes any information yet. Should we stop? 
and your answer was yes, let's solve. Here's one place where it can lead you astray, and this is the XOR data set, right? So we're always checking one feature at a time, but what if it really requires a combination of two features to make any progress? Which is what happens in the XOR data set. So there's A, B, and Y. Y is an XOR of A and B. Split on, split on A, the distributions look uniform, right? So what is the entropy right now before any split? It's the maximal entropy possible, right? This is a uniform distribution. Split on A still looks uniform. Split on B still looks uniform. Information gains are zero. Mm -hmm. But after you split twice, right? After you, you make two branches, this is deterministic. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it may not be a good idea to stop if the information gains go to zero because you're just checking individual information gains, one feature at a time, and that's because your algorithm is greedy. Finding the best decision tree is at the yard, and so that's why we resorted to a greedy algorithm. What you really needed to do was to check for multiple features of that. And you won't know that there's gain possible. Does that make sense? This also means that if your data set consists of noisy features and parity-like XOR type features, decision trees are not going to be able to tell the difference. Right? At a single feature at a time, whether it's really just noise, something uncorrelated, or it's something that when combined with something else does give you some information, decision trees are not going to be able to tell the difference between them. So it's going to be overdone by the way. Okay, let's stop here.